Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the post-Christmas edition, December 27th. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's a day when we remember the beloved disciples, St. John, the Feast of St. John, on 27th of December 2019. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, clergy and laity alike. Welcome to another program. You'll have to excuse me. I'm on the, the, the end of the time zone here. It's earlier for me than it is for George and much earlier for Gavin, who's probably 4 o'clock in the afternoon out there. and uh, Almost time. <laughs> on, the, on the shores of England. So uh, we're going to have another show talk about uh, what was breaking news or at least top of the fold on the Telegraph, but before we get to that, let's talk about your responsibilities as a faithful viewer of Anglican Unscripted, and that is to share the program, to like the program, to comment on the program, which you're best at. If you guys have not gone to the comments and participated, it's time to do so because you're letting other people speak for you, and you don't need to do that. You need to be part of the conversation, which happens at the end of this episode. Uh, Oh, if you're not subscribed, you need to subscribe. And if you look in the show notes, you'll see that we have a podcast that accompanies this. It's not just in video form. You can download this to your iPhones or uh, smartphones anytime you want in podcast form. Uh, gentlemen, welcome to our post-Christmas show. Uh, let's start with you, Gavin. What did you get for Christmas? A new bishop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I got. This is terrifying because... Thank goodness my family don't watch this. Or they'd say, why don't you remember the wonderful presents we gave you? <laughs> and my brother-in-law gave me the Private Eye Annual, which I opened straight away over Christmas lunch and just spent a quarter of an hour falling about laughing at the cartoons. Ah. Uh, so um, my, my daughter, oh, she doesn't watch it, so it's okay. She spent a lot of money on a book by, about William Blake's drawings. She said, Dad, Daddy, I know, I know you're a would-be mystic. You must love William Blake. Well... Blake is so dangerous, and I hate his drawings. But the trouble is now, I couldn't tell her. So I said, thank you, thanks, wonderful. The danger is she'll buy me something by Blake every year now. That's right. it's, <laughs> you need to correct that. It was good, but I like this so much better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and George, you, you were batching it over Christmas. Yes, the family's away. Children out west, wife in Philadelphia, then she went out west to be with the girls. I'm just taking care of Susan's Christmas present, which is a new puppy, a new dog. Yeah, I'm showing the video of your new puppy right now on, on the uh, on the screen for our, our viewers. Uh, we are having a strange Christmas in the Carlson household because we're on a tour. We're visiting uh, many different relatives here in Wisconsin that we've known throughout the years. Uh, my parents, my brother, and stuff like that. So. Basically, to save time amongst adult Christmas givers, we're just exchanging favorite bottles and wine. So Jill and I have brought like six bottles of our favorite wine that's expensive and tastes good, and we've been handing that out with a pre-agreement with everybody else. You're going to give us your favorite wine. And so uh, that's, that's worked well. And we've spoiled our kids, but we're not doing that until we get to Pittsburgh sometime at the end of the week. I don't know. It's a, when you're on Christmas vacation... The schedule is shot in all its chaos. I know that because I woke up like 15 minutes ago for the show. I'm on vacation. Yeah. So let's move on. Um, you guys sent me the article from The Telegraph talking about a further investigation uh, by a reporter into what's happened uh, into the accusations for Jonathan Fletcher, anonymously sourced, which, you know, understandably these are horrible accusations, Let's talk first about how the story has been developing over time. George, give us like the last six months of Jonathan's uh, breaking story. Well, the Jonathan Fletcher story is about the crack up the evangelical establishment in the Church of England. This is, if you will, the twin to the Peter Ball story, where the real story isn't so much the uh, activities of a dirty old man, Rather, it's the institutional cover-up, the tribe or the clan cover-up to protect the image and mystique of one of the stars. Uh, Jonathan Fletcher was the uh, uh, incumbent of Emmanuel at church in Wimbledon, a private chapel uh, in the Church of England. 
very uh, influential evangelical leader, one of the leaders of, well, just pick an evangelical conservative organization and you'll see Jonathan Fletcher involved. He's 77 now. He's stepped down from active ministry. 2017, he uh, lost, I think it was 2017, lost his permission to officiate, which was not widely circulated or known last year. Um, the uh, news became known more widely this year. The uh, evangelical, the Proclamation Trust people, uh, which is cons another conservative group, said, don't have this man in your parish. And then we started getting people contacting us about their psychological abuse uh, at Fletcher's hands. Usually these were young men uh, at a sort of uh, vulnerable age or in vulnerable spots in their life. And various news organizations were working on this and the Telegraph is the first to come into print of the major publications to lay out what Fletcher has done. They have they've succeeded in getting four victims to tell their stories now they've not identified them and it's always iffy when you have anonymous sources because what's to prevent someone from making this stuff up um, and we've seen that sort of thing happen in the political news in the United States where we have people make up stuff about Supreme Court nominees and so on and so forth well you have to liken this more like to a mafia case where the witnesses for their own protection need to be anonymous. Well, why would we say that? Well, I know of several victims, and I know Gavin knows several victims, and if they went public with their name, rank, and serial number, their careers in the Church of England will be over. Because the real story that was detailed here, now all the salacious details of spankings and nude baths and uh, purient questions about masturbation and psychological control, all this and that. That's interesting on one level, but the what I understand to be the deeper issue is that this was known about Jonathan Fletcher by people in positions of authority and influence, and they did nothing about it. And in fact, Fletcher continued to be in position of influence even after parts of this began to drip and drop out. Uh, I hate to say it, but when Private Eye is the leading, is breaking the most news on a story, and that, that's a sad indictment of the system. Well, you mentioned something in your statement about tribalism. And one of the things I kind of realized early on in my Episcopal Anglican walk is uh, there's clubs, there's cliques, there's uh, a caste system almost within... Uh, Anglicanism, and uh, it exists between uh, Anglo-Catholic, the Charismatic, the Evangelicals, the Low Church. Um, if you're not one of us, you're a lesser Anglican. And I thought I could have uh, Gavin speak a little bit to that. Is that just my mind? Is that just a foggy morning brain, or is that real? No, it's true. I, I'm not a very good person to speak on it because I've been refused entrance to almost every clique I've ever come across and there are many of them in the Church of England. Um, and I've never been quite sure why I've been refused entrance, um, perhaps for some good reasons or for some bad reasons. Unfortunately, the, the I mean, my take on this is that there are four major vulnerabilities that, that Christians and the Church has and they're usually sex, money, booze and power. And the Telegraph of have have gone with the wrong story here because um, the sex is pretty pretty minuscule. I mean, it's sp spanking on bottoms, cold baths, repenting of masturbation and pornography. I mean, as you read it, the the salaciousness is all in the kind of the insin you know, the association of the words, not in what someone's actually done. But behind this is power, of course, and the real problem with the the setup that Jonathan Fletcher. Uh, ran is that he ran part of the evangelical underworld in which power was exercised quite ruthlessly so that um, the reason why people put up with his odd penchant for slippers and cold baths was they didn't want to be excluded from his very powerful and very attractive club and that's why he got away with it but the problem is that as this has come to light so and, and, and people have got 
um, uh, entranced by the sexual innuendo, of which there is only very little, they've ignored the fact that the power abuse continues because a number of the churches that are part of this circle have been phoning up some of the victims mm -hmm. and saying, don't you dare talk to anybody, don't you ruin Jonathan's reputation, or, or what, or you'll, you'll be excluded. So it's it's the it's the same thing, and um, and I I would think it's a great shame if we follow the example <laughs> of the press. Um, sorry, my daughter's phoning. I thought uh, it was the Pope. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think she, she overheard my remarks about William Blake and the book somehow. <laughs> but I think it's a shame in a way that and I, I that the that, that, that the church may get caught up by concentrating on this. The sexual peccadilloes, uh, you know, on a scale of one to ten, are quite low, and and still not do something about the power because the power thing continues. I had rather hoped that that um, the the issues that this raises might continue to draw Justin Welby into the spotlight over the Smythe affair at the 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 Ewan camps because it's the same circle, and the evidence we have is that it would have been almost impossible. For somebody with responsibility, uh, particularly someone who lived with a man called Mark Rushton, who is the centre of all this, these groups in Cambridge, as Justin Welby did for a while, not to know. And so on, on, on Twitter, every so often, a, a victim s says, you know, thank you for apologising, Archbishop, for X, but you still haven't apologised for the, the um, terrible time I had at the hands of your organisation and the UN camps. So what can we what can we do about this? Well, nothing really, because clearly the people who are exercising the power either don't know about it or are unrepentant. The Daily Telegraph isn't talking about it. Um, and, and what can what what can we do? We we all we can do is examine ourselves and the groups we belong to, and try and uh, and not practice these kinds of inclusive, exclusive things at an existential level. I want to defend the Daily Telegraph. Uh, because they basically printed what they can. Uh, I have been working on this story for almost a year now, and I can't print anything because the people I've spoken to will tell me you can't tell my story. Mm. Um, and this, I, I hopefully, this is the first of a series, the first in a step of articles of laying out what the crime is, if you will. And then it's the cover-up, which I agree with you is the bigger story, but so few people are willing to speak on the record about this that you cannot, as a reporter, run with cover-up accusations until you have uh, something hard to say. And that, uh, in my experience of working with a particular victim um, and hearing these stories of, uh, of abuse and uh, bullying and this and that, and then I go to try to confirm it, I can't, I can't get any traction. We've not had, the, the Citadel has not been stormed. Uh, just look what's happened with Jonathan, look with the Jonathan Smythe issue. The Smythe issue, it's been out there for almost eight years and in various forms of, since the first people came forward. And those people still have, are being cold shouldered by the establishment. If you're a young clergyman in your 40s and you see how the church treats the Jonathan Smythe issue, are you going to want to joust at windmills for uh, a cause that the establishment protects their own? It, so I, I, just want to, I just want to say that the Daily Telegraph is not being salacious merely to be salacious to prevent, you know, there's some newspapers that uh, love printing the naughty vicar or the choir mistress story. This is not that level. But it's as much as they can get right now, and good for them for doing this hard work. Well, I think is in a, in a way it's a horror story because we're if people don't know we're not talking about uh, you know your businessman. We're talking about the victims here are most likely priests who mm -hmm. are working within the Church of England um, who are dealing with this, and we we certainly know the names of many, and certainly more than four. Uh, we here have only through the telegraph the story of four of the victims, and I I don't know if it gets any more sexual with different victims or or not. So I don't want to uh, put that fully to the side, but I look at this and I say, how is this any different than the dean of the, the cathedral we had here in the ACNA, where they did a full investigation, and the psychological abuse was literally hell. And 
if I if I may speak to that specifically, sure, yeah. what Neil Labar, the Bishop of the Gulf Atlantic Diocese, did is a model, I believe, for any bishop in this issue. This is the dean of his cathedral, the most powerful, the most influential, the wealthiest parish he has. And he initially thought, well, I can take care of this myself. And then he realized he couldn't. The power dynamics and the structural dynamics were such that he'd get nowhere. So he asked the Bishop of San Joaquin, Eric, Eric Meniz. And Bishop Meniz, with the assistant of the uh, interim uh, rector at the cathedral, Bob Duncan, did an excellent independent, they went and got an independent assessor to investigate this thing. And when it was independent, if you're, a, if you're uh, an ordination, for, if you're an ordinand for the priesthood in the Gulf Atlantic Diocese and you admit to your bishop that the rector of his most powerful parish was uh, playing strange games with you, you're going to be dreadfully frightened that all this time and effort and energy you've put into becoming a priest is going to be, be, be nailed, stopped, because it, and, what's and, wrong with you? And the reason and for that is... Allowing the, allowing the independent investigation has given this both a professional uh, airing as well as not victimizing the victims a second time. And what it also does is to allow us to make a distinction between, um, b between two forms of sin. Uh, and so, so you know, the, the first form of sin, the abuse of sex, uh, and even bullying, is, is something that we know everyone uh, gets caught up in at some point or another to some extent or other. It's part of being sinful. We shouldn't be surprised that the only reason for being a Christian is we get to repent and say sorry, be forgiven, and go in a different direction. The problem with the cover-up is it's an entirely different kind of sin because it's predicated on not repenting. <laughs> you're saying we're not going to admit we've done wrong actually we're going to pretend we haven't done wrong and as jesus that comes very close i think to what our lord was saying when uh, you know there's one sin you can't be forgiven about and that's the sin against the holy spirit we often argue about what that is but i've thought it's the deliberal mi deliberate miscalling of evil for good and good for evil and in a sense the cover-up is frighteningly close to that it's the refusing to admit we've done wrong and pretend we're okay so the catholic church is beset, as we know, with um, with some terrible uh, sexual abuse stories. But worse than that are the cover-ups and the refusal to make people accountable because with repentance and confession, we can be forgiven, thank God. We may have to bear the wounds of the consequences of our actions, but with the cover-up and the constant continual bullying, there is no forgiveness. And the real, the, that's why I think George Ackley, the Telegraph, are after the wrong story. The, 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 the horse has bolted. That, that, that horse went a long time ago. The, the, you know, the, the, the horse of the sexual manipulation. The, the present story is the extent to which a church that self-defines by a call to repentance won't repent and tell the truth. Hmm. Now, Emmanuel Wimbledon has brought in an independent organization Oh, the name just went out of my head, 31-8 or so, yeah. um, to look into these things. And I think we need to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're going to do a thorough job. They're not beholden to the evangelical powers that be. So I don't think they're going to give a whitewash story. So on one hand, we need to wait and see what their report tells us, and that could be a year's time. Well, let's hope they're listening but, to us, because their, their terms of reference ought to include not just what Jonathan Fletcher did, but what the but president, the, but, sure, but, sure. But, but, but the people who phoned up on behalf of the major churches associated with Fletcher to intimidate the victims into silence. That's what they should be talking about. My fear is they'll talk about gym slippers and cold baths. How do you know that, Gavin? I know. How do you know that people can How do you know that people intimidated witnesses? How do you because, know that? Because the witness, several of the witnesses, have complained to me graphically about the intimidation. Um, so I know it's happened on three to, to three different people. Yeah, and you, you had the same reports, uh, George, as well. You know. And I've, I've heard from, so, and I also know from three other different people who've been dealing with perhaps three other witnesses each, or one each, I don't know how many, that they've had the same experience. So it's, uh, it's reported speech, but, it, but it's also consistent with the facts. And the facts are that we have these people speaking anonymously to the Telegraph. Well, they wouldn't be speaking anonymously if they hadn't been intimidated. That's true. Yeah. Well, what, just 
Now, if you, I'm going to say something that me. is un, is uh, oh, is difficult, gosh. but the the tribal wars make this even worse, yeah. because uh, some homosexual activists, gay activists, are using this whole issue as a club which with to beat all evangelicals, and so on the principle, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. There's also a tendency among some of the victims not to want to give ammunition to people who seek to destroy your 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 club. I was so thinking about this this earlier, George, and I was wondering if if how we can bring goodness out of this instead of complaining about other people's shortcomings and misdemeanors, as as indeed we are journalistically, that's inevitable. I was thinking that the the, the Church of England is a very funny church because it's it's a composite church made up of three different parties: um, uh, high, low, and 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 liberal. And unfortunately, the the reality of it is that they tend to hate each other, <laughs> or, or at least define each other by the way they're not one another. So, um, and this is a shame because the Church of England could have been one of the richest communions going because it has this breadth of spirituality. Or it could be the most Trinitarianly dysfunctional church because they won't like each other. And I think one of the things, lessons we can learn from this is if, we, if we, we're part of a Trinitarian church reflecting a God who is multi-personal and yet drawn together in unity, it's important that we learn to deal with, with um, elements, different elements of differentiation and the call to love in the right way. So the call to love should draw us together in humility and, and, and respect for one another, rejoicing in our differences. But but too often we manage to do it the opposite way around. We celebrate our differences and we're not very good on the unity of love. So I think not just the Church of England, but it probably applies to, to parishes, uh, and and to other groups, what what we're invited to do is to is to reflect on the way in which we celebrate difference in the right kind of sense, variety, creativity, um, artistry, but at the same time drawing them all together into the deeper truth, which is the unity of God, um, as opposed to a kind of Buddhist mishmash, which I'm not talking about. So I think there are lessons we can all learn from this and turn turn our, our scathing critiques of, of Christian failure into an aspirational for living a life in the Holy Trinity, which is, which is redemptive. Well, there isn't a church that's trying to do this deliberately, and that's the ACNA. They, are try they have uh, the issue of women's orders, and there are two camps that are unalterably opposed to the other's viewpoints, yet they have sought to seek what is common and with the under, not to set to one side saying it's unimportant, it's very important, but rather to work towards the unity that Christ is seeking, mindful of the differences. Now, this 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 is viewed by some zealots on both sides as a sellout of principle to the mantra of uh, <clears throat> unity. So it's it's a delicate line. It's a delicate line. I mean, uh, that you're walking there. Gavin, do you think I'm uh, oversimplifying this, or do you no, think this I, is? I, I, no, I you're, you're making you're making my brain hurt as I try and work <laughs> out. <laughs> well, what's and so I, I think, to, but so whilst it's hurting, I, I think what I thought was that so this 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 spirit and truth isn't there, and um, what you're saying the ASNA do, is doing is it's it's doing a very good job in spirit, because if we do things in spirit, we do it in love, compassion, and respect. But there is truth. And the, the issue about truth is that uh, if we don't get the truth right, then the wheels fall off. It doesn't, in the end, work. So one of the reasons why I'm fairly passionately on one side of this particular debate is that if we don't get the truth right about uh, not allowing feminism to reconfigure the DNA of the church, at some point, the more wheels will fall off. So it, it, that, that's why it's a matter of, of, of truth. And of course, people on the other side would say, well, um, actually, feminism has brought into the Christian revelation insights that should have been there 20 years, 20, 100 years before, and it's just been too long. So these are, these are two big monolithic truth claims we need to choose between, and we have to get them right. And if I'm wrong, for example, I'm, I need to be quiet and to, to celebrate this new revelation. And if I'm right, then people must repent of this new revelation and embrace the way the church has worked um, all the time since. So we do it in compassionate spirit, not demonizing each other, but, but we have to still nonetheless be passionate and forensic about the truth. Well, I think what? one of the things important about the ACNA, and it's a discussion I had with uh, Archbishop Duncan a long time ago, is 
you know, as reporters, Kevin, stop asking us what divides us and what we don't like. Ask us what we're for, what Christ is for, what what you know brings the unity of the church. And you know, that is the glue for the ACNA. You know, what they find and unify under um, is their strength. Yes, there's dividing issues, but I think over time, by focusing on the unity, they can deal with what divides them. Oh, and I think that's the great thing that the charismatic movement brought 30 or 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. One of the wonderful things about it was is it healed this partisanship in Anglican circles. And you found Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals um, uh, sharing the gifts of the Spirit and suddenly being thrilled that they could identify Jesus in each other. Now, having done that, having, having really been blessed by a unity of the Spirit, that it gave a very different platform for working out the theological differences because then what you do is um, you hold hands and you do it together instead of starting off by seeing the other person as your enemy. And, and if you begin like that, as we so often have, have done, then you know, you know you can't get anywhere. So if you begin with, with love and penitence and mutuality in spirit, that gives you a better chance of working out the truth bit. Well, the difficulty within the Anglican Church of Canada and the Episcopal Church is that there have been uh, half-hearted attempts to do this, but at the end of the day, the political bloc that seeks justice and that justice can't be compromised, their interpretation of justice results in someone like Bishop Love being persecuted. And, and that's, it. and or uh, Keith Ackerman being thrown out of the Episcopal Church. And that the, the, the lust of, and the spirit of partisanship is so powerful that uh, well, that's, it, that's what, it, it, it overwhelms the power of the Spirit. Well, I, I agree, and I think that's part of the problem of being a Reformation church. If, if you're a, so the gift of being a Reformation church is you bring reform, and you say to the aged parent, uh, here are some things you've missed which, you, which you know, were part of your original first love, and, and we can regraft them in for you. Uh, now, if that's true, that's a really wonderful thing to happen. But if your reform is, is more that of the... Um, the rather bullshit teenager saying, I don't understand these rules, I don't like them, I'm going to kick up hell until I get my way. Um, you can call it justice as much as you like, but, it, but it's not a charism of reform. So I think it's incumbent on those who are trying to change things to make it really very clear in, in the common mind uh, that what they're, you know, this justice, these new values, are actually the heart of the gospel and have been lived and, and perceived in all places at all times by all Christians. And if, if, if you don't have that, then I'm not sure you have the right to, to um, kick ass in the name of reform. <laughs> well, people are going to be interesting. What was the puppy trying to chew? It, it succeeded in <laughs> chewing one of my clergy collars. <laughs> so I, uh, oh, no. <laughs> Those things are expensive. And, um, you know, whilst we're having the discussion of the decade, little puppies in the background destroying things. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to go back to you. You said it's kind of, you know, the, the interpretation of all. I think one of the bigger problems we have is Church of Canada and the Episcopal Church look at God as no different than the Force from Star Wars. You know, search your feelings, Luke. Use the Force. Mm. And we've gotten to the point where, uh, certainly in the last... 15 years, it's all about feelings. And that's the destruction now. It's not about the theology. It's not about God. It's about us. And, you know, we've certainly touched on this many times, but, you know, here we are once again uh, with the Fletcher story, with the cover-ups, uh, with, with all the news in the church. Nobody's going to understand what we're talking because we don't have a common understanding of Jesus Christ and a common understanding of God, you know. Well, perhaps that's an invitation to get our unity of our unity of spirit right. Instead of at the moment, it's spirits, isn't it? Our, yes, it is. our own existential comfort. That sounds like spirits of of a different kind. Uh, unity in the spirit is is well. First, it was bowing down in humility to something more important than you. Um, and when and we're none of us very very good at that. Um, well, we aren't because. We all have our kingdoms and our tribes and our fiefdoms. We don't want what God wants. We want what we want. And I've seen this to every different degree uh, by following and, and uh, understanding Christ, uh, church
church and Christian history. That at some point we all sit down and we've created our own little kingdoms. It's a, it's a sad reflection. What should have been the news, and I want to talk about this because there's persecution going around the world for Christians. I just read a report on the BBC, not top section, not top of the Telegraph, not top of any newspaper, somewhere back in the back. 11 Christians were beheaded uh, this week in Nigeria. Did you know? No. No, we can, you know, that type of news doesn't make news anymore. No, Why is that, George? It, it, well, it's like uh, our ongoing joke at Anglican Inc. Kevin, do you want another story about corruption in India? India, sure, yeah. Uh, I could write one every day. Uh, we could write stories. That we could, There are whole Voice of the Martyrs is an organization that is dedicated to reporting this news. And it's an ongoing, the... Well, I think this is, we, we had something fascinating where Prince Charles and then and Boris Johnson, both in Christmas messages or messages around Christmas time, heightened uh, awareness of the persecution of Christians uh, around the world. And I am heartened that they did this because I can't, I can't, Prince Charles has been doing this for a number of years, good for him, but it's the first time I've seen a major government figure doing this outside of some election stump speech for constituents. Well, I, I could, Kevin, you'll have to cut me off here because this, this, at this point I can become explosively... Go for um, it. Well, you see, <laughs> we, we have to get rid of the word phobia out of all our social discourse. Anything where you put phobia onto the back of is designed to not allow us to tell the truth. So whether it's homophobic uh, or Islamophobic, um, to some extent racism overlaps in this slightly uh, not that we should ever be racist but but that, uh, that there is always a tension between being anxious about the different and being comfortable where you belong but but that often gets uh, miscalled as racism but the problem with the phobia stuff is it's wonderful that Boris Johnson can do this it's a, it's a fantastic thing but out there ingrained in our society in law through all the agencies is phobia so if you stand up and say I'm really upset that some Muslims have chopped off the heads of some of my compatriots, in, 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 Christian compatriots in Nigeria, you are being homophobic. And so, you know, how, until you can find, we can find an antidote for this ghastly Marxist um, closing down of free speech and, and imposition of thought crime phobia, it doesn't matter that Boris Johnson and Prince Charles make a small stand at Christmas because the energy on the other side is like a steamroller. And all we've done is we've, we've sent a small blancmange with a sticker in, in front of the steamroller. And, and only one side will win. We have, pro well, I want to follow up to this real quick. You talked phobia. Uh, we are as stupid as stupid can get. I was reading a story in an English newspaper about a man who had transgender surgery, who is now a female, but still proclaims himself a man and is under phobic, you know, accusations by the transgendered society of earth they're just the twitter storm is amazing how dare you say you're a man you surgically changed yourself he's no dummy he knows he's still a man you can't you can't change it and it just we are so stupid as a people well i actually yeah. think the tip i think the tipping point has been reached uh with uh, jk rowling and yeah, this english academic it where J.K. Rowling, who is on the hard left of most social and political issues, uh, is standing up for biology and science, and she's not backing down, or at least she hasn't yet. And the, at this point, the, ridic the, the claims of the transgender activists are now being received with a bit of ridicule and, and uh, rolling of eyes. I think it's, I think the tipping point has been reached. These good. I hope so. You know, these, these people these people are nut jobs, and I think that is now becoming the conventional wisdom. This is it's where so George, you you do Winnie the Pooh and I do Eeyore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was very pleased when this English academic, whose name is, is, is if it's the right one, is called Catherine Stock. Uh, she's a lesbian professor of philosophy at Sussex, where I used to teach, and she followed me on Christmas Day on Twitter. So I wrote to her saying. Hey, Kathleen, I don't think we ever met, but, but you know, respect and congratulations. Normally, 
uh, I wouldn't, you know, I, I wouldn't be given much warmth or sympathy from a from a, a hard line second wave feminist lesbian philosopher. But she wrote back very cheerfully, saying, you know, you'll remember what. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter what she said. Um, however, we're on we're on the same side. But she's hugely beleaguered. I mean, hugely. The whole university is against her. And and J.K. Rowling has moved from heroine to monster in forty eight hours. And George, I, I I wish I could believe you, but you know, if Kathleen turns her university around and J.K. Rowling regains all her lost fans next week, then your sunny disposition will have been vindicated, and it's not as bad as 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 my apple in you know, apocalyptic person thought but i don't see it happening i i i think that the cultural the cultural reeducation that our society has has been infused with over the last 10 to 20 years is is runs pretty deep now and and something more than uh, something more is required to to get us free from it well you know, Kevin, Kevin, you, i i would i would answer you gavin that uh First, I think you put far too much importance on the volume of uh, nuts on Twitter, <laughs> yeah. uh, and and you know universities, yeah, univers universities are like Sweden or the Netherlands; they're conformist places, and the conformity can switch on a dime. It can switch on a dime. It switched, you know, when the when the, when the Dutch were occupied by the Nazis, they were pro-Nazi until they were anti-Nazi. Uh, it switched on a dime. The same people who one day. Uh, we're, we're for it or the next day against it. Which is why, I, this is why they've gone for our laws. They know that universities can switch and newspapers can switch back and forth all the time. And they've gone for the laws. They want to change the laws and they want to make phobia a crime. And they want to make thought so Kevin, a crime. But, e but even with the laws, you have jury nullification, where jurors will not convict on these laws. Kevin, how many laws do we have? What's that? How many how many, how many people listen to Anglican Unscripted, do you think? Uh, listen 5, to? I, I would say we have 1,000 listeners yeah. and 5,000 viewers. Okay, so listen. All of our 6,000 viewers go into this next year, and when anyone mentions the word phobic to you, say, no, 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 no to phobia. <laughs> no, we no. won't have it. <laughs> we refuse to engage in any conversation where somebody uses the word phobia. And, and, wait, wait. Uh, so you're saying people are phobic phobics? Uh, yes, but we are phobic phobics. I've, I've tried that one. It's too complicated for most people in the middle of a conversation. But what I'm, what I'm saying is that we, we can't just sit here and lament and hope. We actually have to carry this one into a struggle of some kind. And, and if more people did um, exhibited the common sense that George believes that they have, um, then let's turn it into action and say, and refuse. <laughs> and and send, you know, get rid of this phobic thing back because we, we won't comply with it. We'll become well, conscientious objectors to, to phobism. Well, see, Gavin, that's why uh, you're a Catholic. You believe in works. I believe in faith. <laughs> <laughs> Gavin's giving you a progression of how you can uh, build up your merit, treasury of merit in heaven. All, and I'm just saying, trust in the Lord. All my works are just a natural effusion of faith, George. I, I want to guarantee to our audience at least once an episode, we're going to cut on Anglicanism and we're going to cut on Catholicism. You know, I need a Baptist in the program so we can cut on Baptist. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> uh, they'll get used to it. Gentlemen, we have come up on a wonderful 41 minutes of pure Anglican Unscripted. Uh, wonderful holidays. We pray for uh, each and uh, of our viewers. I want to let you know that this is the last episode of 2019. I think We're not doing Monday. Uh, Monday is what's Monday? Hold on. I can't do Monday. I'm traveling. I could do Tuesday. You do Tuesday. Uh, it's cool that people get to see us do our calendars here. Uh, 31st, we could do it. If you could do Tuesday. I, I, need, to, I need to speak to certain authorities, but provisionally. Yeah, <laughs> if you can get permission from Mrs. Ashington and you, George, you from uh, Mrs. Conger, and I will talk to Mrs. Anglican TV and uh, be sure I can record. <laughs> but let's do December 31st. That'll be our last episode. And let's have a best of. You know, one of those end of the year things. Would you George the, cheap. And George keep the cheap. cute people? I want the cute puppy on the show too. <laughs> that will increase our viewership. <laughs> Come on, I need. To, I need Get that big old dog. Where's that big old dog? Come here, John. Come and come and say hello to the viewers. This is my oh my beloved dog. Ready? One, two, three. Don't hurt your back. 
<laughs> Whoa, there he is. Whoa, say hello to the guy. <laughs> the big puppy. He's like, what's going on here, man? Oh, <sighs> Daddy, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conker. I'm Gavin Ashenden. This is Megan. You've been listening to Anglican Unscripted on the feast of St. John the Apostle, the 27th of December, 2019. God bless you. Bye.